This video is sponsored by Squarespace. If you're looking to build your art portfolio website or online store to sell your work, check out Squarespace. They have marketing tools and analytics so you can build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Hi guys, my name is Scott Flanders. I'm an artist and game developer. I work at <laughs> I work at Riot Games and uh, I'm going to be demoing what I call my shape carving technique and we're going to be creating an image of Swamp Thing. All right. <laughs> my intent with the image is to create something like a poster print. I want it to, in the end, to be something like 13 by 19 inches. I've got a 600 pixels, just a lot of resolution because a lot of the work I'm going to be doing is with the lasso tool. I want to make sure that, you know, we just have, don't have any stair stepping, no uh, funny edges, like really clean edge work. So I've got a reference image set up in front of me here. I've got previous images of Swamp Thing by artists I admire, um, as long as a bunch of environment imagery, photography of swamps and jungles, swamp wildlife that might make their way into the image, images for color inspiration. Basically, I just have a big wall of inspiration in front of me that I'll be able to make use of at any time. So when I start off, I tend to begin with uh, like a silhouette, just very, very simple shapes. Initially, my goal will be to just get some quote unquote paint on the canvas, just to begin making some marks. And you know, everything is done in layers, so at any point, I'll be able to move these shapes around. And you're gonna see me cycling through viewing modes in Photoshop a lot. That's something, that's a kind of habit of mine, where sometimes I just like to silence the noise, get rid of the rest of the tabs and toolbar. So I'll go out to the, what I call presentation mode so I can just evaluate how the image is coming along. This is pretty fun for me because I spent a lot of time when I first got into games. I worked on a game called Evolve and it was like a sci-fi monster hunting game. And it took place on this like primeval jungle world. And so there was like a lot of opportunity or a lot of demand to do a lot of jungle scenes and to get some familiarity with the kind of flora that you experience in a jungle. A lot of time looking at bromeliads and ferns and lianus vines, Spanish moss. Oops, removing that mark because it wasn't at full opacity. And a lot of this shape work in the beginning, it's really important that they're, it's solid. So you'll see later on why, as I start to introduce color. I did so much of that kind of thing that I really internalized those shapes. I was able to commit them to memory, more or less. And you may notice, like, all this is being done with Lasso Tool. I use Lasso Tool almost exclusively in the digital work I'm doing. I'm a big fan of comic book art and covers, and I love, you know, what guys like Riot Splash Team do. Those guys are some of the best artists in the world. But some of that imagery, you know, there's a lot of foreshortening, like Spider-Man, you know, like, I, I, that's what I call it, like the Spider-Man, you know, that my, my hand is gonna get you. And for some reason, that kind of imagery just fundamentally isn't what I'm interested in creating. And again, that's not really a, it's not really a judgment. There's so many ways that art can go down, you know, that images can be created. And that's part of the beauty of the thing. That's what's wonderful about it. For some reason, this more graphic, basically flat imagery really appeals to me. It's very striking. It's a lot more like, like a sign, a piece of heraldry, like you'd see on a shield or a banner. In some ways, that puts me at a kind of deficit because, you know, the entertainment industry uh, prioritizes high fidelity because for the most part, we're trying to create the illusion of, of reality, of depth. Basically doing <laughs> silhouettes all the damn time. I wouldn't say it's in demand, but what it does is a few things. Mainly, it forces you to take your shapes seriously, to actually invest in them right from the start. It's very common for artists who want to, you know, you want to get to the sexy stuff. You want to get to that dodge tool. You want to get to that chromatic aberration for the finish. And that makes total sense. Because again, usually the priority is on creating the illusion of reality. But what happens is in the race to get to the rendering, I think a lot of times people forget to give what I see as like the proper amount of care to their shapes. And I'm basically of the opinion that a majority of art that gets created out there is, it's like finished prematurely, like taken to a finish or to rendering prematurely before the shapes are really worth investing in. For my students, I say, uh, 
there will be no turd polishing in my class. I'd rather they spend the entire semester just working with silhouettes, developing their sensitivity to shapes, than rendering it all and just learning how to communicate, like thinking like a graphic designer, like a sign designer. Does this sign, this sequence of shapes you're presenting, is this saying what you think it's saying? Is it communicating what you really intend for it to communicate? A lot of times, they're not. <laughs> okay, so part of my initial plan here was to depict Swamp Thing as, you know, being like the benefactor hero for a kid. The pose I'm currently working with, it's actually inspired by an image I admire by Dean Cornwell, but as I'm starting to develop it now, it might be a little too suggestive because the plan is that the kid is going to end up in his crotch. And, you know, that's just not going to fly here at Proco Studios. What the fuck? Get out of here, Stan. <laughs> oh, look, that kid looks like an alien. And I press, I use F10 to flip canvas. Basically mirroring your image is a very clear way to detect abnormalities or funny business in your image. I want basically like a like a stand of trees where there's a bunch of fallen snags. And it's a lot of aggressive shapes, sharp points of broken trees. It's almost like inherently tragic, you know? It's like a sense of melancholy. That seems consistent with the subject matter, Swamp Thing. You know, it's opportunity to show this hanging moss and vines. And you get all these interesting little negative spaces. It also gives you an opportunity to create some overlap and start to suggest some depth. I think one other, you know, real benefit of shape work like this is, you know, if you can learn to, just through shape, communicate an idea about form, like turning in perspective or in space, that's powerful. You can communicate that a leaf is turning over away from camera, that a head is slightly oriented towards the sky, but with no interior information. I think that's a strong start. Again, it's about, it's about paying just as much attention to your interior shapes as your exterior shapes. That's, or at least that's what I tell students. The idea is not, hey, go, you know, work in silhouette for the rest of your life. That's really not the goal. That's not practical. The thought is that if you can break something down to the most fundamental element, which is like the primary form, its, its contour, its shape, if you can start to really get a handle on that and develop some sensitivity, what I mean by sensitivity is like, the ability to navigate choices in a way that's like purposeful where you're like after something and you know why and you can articulate it if you have strong shapes you're going to have a strong image it's almost as simple as that i really believe that for most artists the, the goal is just to create images which are iconic which can last in your mind that you'd want to put on your wall okay this that boom the way I'm composing this picture, this is like an old school way of, you know, breaking down a picture. Foreground, middle ground, background. Like that's how I start with just like basically three values. And then you can start to break things up and get more sophisticated. But initially this is how I, I like to begin. It just makes it more manageable for me. One thing you gotta be careful of here is like overly convenient, convenient framing of my characters. You know, I've created this like little framing right here over this girl and I don't want that. So I'm gonna have to cut into this and same here. It's like look, framing swamp thing, you know, framing moon. I mean, that can be, a, it's like a part of creating a powerful composition, but it can also, there's like, I, I think there's like a, a kind of line to walk where you want something to have some feeling of naturalism, like it's not overly contrived or composed, but then you want to create lines, angles, shapes that complement your picture. Now, this is, this is basically the part, you know, when I use that term, shape carving, this is what I'm referring to. When I'm carving in shadow shapes, like laying in shadow shapes. At Watts Atelier, I've heard those guys uh, refer to it as like mapping shadow shapes. Similar ideas. And granted, this is an interpretive way of dealing with light. This, these are very like limited or uh, primitive lighting conditions, but they work and I like them. They're kind of dramatic. It's like, it's like I'm starting to see where light was not. Was, I don't know, maybe a way to describe it. There's a technique in comic books. I think they refer to it as feathering, but it works pretty well when I'm doing this technique. You use it to indicate like a softer edge transition. And I'll show that real quick. So like say here on the leg, I'm over here on the quad. I don't want it to be maybe so harsh. I want to communicate the idea that it's like rolling over, rounded. 
You don't always want that. Sometimes you want a hard edge. You want that abrupt change back. This is almost like texturing or uh, rendering, you know? It's like you're texturing the edge. You know, I run the risk of going too naturalistic with my shapes and it kind of stiffens things up. Like search the, sh the shapes are as interesting. Sometimes I want to bring in more of a like stylistic interplay between hard and soft edges in regards to shape. Like here on the shoulder right now, currently I've got a soft shape. It's a rounded shape. But sometimes in order to create, you know, a little more dynamism, I want to create a little more interplay, like a flow. It's, you know, similar idea as, uh, you know, curve, counter curve. Got a hard shape and then I got a soft shape. Not into that arm. Boom. Goodbye. Got to do something else with it. So speaking of like thinking about shapes and stuff, it's really important here that I start to get some shapes in here that are recognizably related to Swamp Thing. And I think one of the key shapes is that nose that it's like the nasal bone, that exposed nasal bone. It's also potentially like this um, hulking back thing. But I like that texture I have. But it's gonna need more slope, like more of that Mignola monkey slope that you see in his characters. It's like you have big sloping traps, trapezius muscle. So I think we need that. But I'm not 100% happy with the weapon. Like earlier, I mentioned the idea of Swamp Thing as a kind of a throwback to the idea of the like archetypal, like the wild man or the green man. You don't really have a lot of that in comic books, actually. That's sort of character archetype. And for me, when I think of like the wild man or like a primitive, a primitive weapon type, I think of uh, like blunt weapons, like things like war clubs. Specifically, there's one from the Hercules or the Gilgamesh of the Old Testament. It's a character named Samson, and he does a bunch of superhero stuff. He like fights off this army with the jawbone of an ass. He wields it like a club. There's something that always appealed to me about that a lot. Like you didn't just beat him. You beat him with the most caveman shit you could ever use. If you're into metal, Samson is your guy. Here I'm sort of exploring the idea that what if there are like mushrooms, fungi growing from his body? But there's a potential price to pay for making those marks actually. I have to really think about it. That's better. That's better. Ah, yes. Okay. Because on the leg, part of the way that leg is obscured in that space, it's important to make sure that it's still going to read. You know, if I deviate too much from a shape that is easily recognizable as leg or as like calf muscle, that's going to compromise its read. But when I moved it up, like this is something that happens a lot, actually. You know, I'll make these shapes and because they're not rendered, they're, they're like Lego pieces. They're like these raw materials that I can move around the image. I use a term with students a lot when we're, they're just working in silhouette, silhouette kit bashing, basically, where you're just taking these parts, these very simple parts, and you're moving them around and trying to find arrangements of those shapes that maybe you uh, didn't initially expect or weren't part of your initial plan, but that might benefit the art in a way you did not expect. It's like a, a controlled happy accident. I kind of know the conditions that need to be present for a certain kind of happy accident to occur. And so I simulate those conditions. I first have to invest in strong base shapes. That's what we have here. We have some like character shapes. We have some good bits to work with. But once I've established those, it's a lot easier to start moving some things around and finding places where they fit. Let's see, let's do it with this. Like I've seen some depictions of Swamp Thing where, you know, he's got foliage growing out of him, like broader foliage. And that can be cool because it can give you some of that same sort of visual weight that you get on a character with or a character who's like wearing lots of heavy furs. They did that on Game of Thrones. They did a lot of fantasy films. It's sort of making a heroic character seem more imposing or powerful. By creating lots of layers on them, it bulks out the form, particularly up in the traps. And so, you know, so if you put like a fur mantle, a bunch of layered furs or pauldrons, like in every fantasy game ever, you can really go a long way towards making your character appear more imposing. So it's kind of like a go-to trick. I've seen artists where they, they do like, you know, you have like the vertebral columns and you have these like ridges. And I actually forget, Marshall could tell us, Stan could tell us, whatever it is like that. You know, the bits that kind of project off the top of the vertebrae. And in some animals, they get extremely elongated, especially where like a lot of muscles are binding onto them. Like say in the cervical vertebrae on a rhinoceros or on uh, most of the big heavy bovids, things like bison, water buffalo, 
Yeah, but it basically gives you, yeah, the equivalent of spikes, so like a spike armor, but it's like briar wood, you know, like thorny vines. But I don't want to get too crazy with it. I'm kind of hold off. I'm going to leave it there and think about it. It's always okay to just take a, take a minute to think about it. Speed is cool. Confidence is nice. But thinking, I believe the most useful thing you can do is take some damn time to think about what you're doing. So I'm doing that feathering now. Watch this. I'm going to zoom in here. I've done it a couple times here, but so this is to show like a rolling of form, like around the deltoid right there, on this inside of the traps in the neck. Yeah, it's a technique usually used in comic books because they're limited to you know two values. So when you do a feather, what's happening is you're creating a third value when you're using like two tones, like black and white. When you do the feather, you're creating a third tone which takes place in the troughs and peaks or peaks and valleys of these little teeth. There's an interplay. It's like an optical value blend between light and dark. I'm going to make these sticks dark. You know, so I'm going to do something here. Uh, pixel lock. I've been doing it a lot, but I'll point it out real quick. So I only want to affect the pixels that are on this particular layer, the, the layer with Swamp Thing on it. I do not want to be affecting the pixels in the background. If you go to layer lock or pixel lock, this little checkerboard thing right here, I will only be affecting the pixels on that particular layer that I've selected. I wonder what this kid should be doing. Maybe he should be holding a pumpkin. I think his arm needs to be a different spot in general. It's not that it was bad. It's just not really getting me anything. It's just kind of doing the same shit Swamp Thing was doing. Little kids have little skinny arms. My boy, he's a strong little guy. He's a big little boy, but it's just hilarious how small, how weak kids are at first. Like, like this, this pumpkin right here, he carved. We were getting our shape carving on and he carried it. He chose it from the grocery store. And when he was carrying it into the house, he was in full on superhero mode. Oh, it was so heavy, daddy. It's so heavy. Life is all about carving big, heavy pumpkins. Yeah, I like that better. There's something going on here like a I don't know, maybe this kid was going to go trick-or-treating and, and Swamp Thing is escorting him, keeping him safe as he has to cross through the bayou on his way to the other side of town. Make a little adjustment there in my perspective. Let's see, pull it out. I meant to lift the moon up more. This, these arteries, these big veins, are useful in two ways. One, they make them look jacked. And they also go play some role in helping communicate that this guy has like roots and vines growing on him. With, with children, I actually will tend towards a greater, a higher degree of stylization. I bet it's not, you know, it's not exactly mystery why. The kids are innocent and funny and, you know, sort of inherently whimsical. A casual attention to anatomy or structure. I think can actually benefit depictions of kids. You know, I mean, they, they literally are, they're like noodles. Like they can bend in ways that do not make sense. They're like these super tough little stretch Armstrong people. I want to do some Charlie Brown face on here, you know, some goofy grin kind of stuff. That is entirely inconsistent with the way I'm handling like light, these like harsh shadows, top down lighting. You know, it's not really logical. But again, like part of the, I really like that mark though, laying down, like it makes, this is, this kid now becomes like a cartoon, this kind of goofy looking cartoon fool. And to me, there's something really fun about that. Like that's worth the kind of deviation from light logic. Like it looks better, it just looks better. It looks more fun. I like to put a frame on my images. That's something that I believe helps with presentation. A lot of my work tends towards impressionism. You know, whatever I can do to sort of support the condition of finish. And a frame does that, communicates to the viewer, look at me, I'm done. You know what's even more horrifying than Swamp Thing babysitting a child on Halloween? Trying to figure out how to build an attractive website that won't horrify your fans. Well, fear not, because this video is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that you can use to build your very own art store and portfolio website. Squarespace offers a lot of attractive features to artists, with customizable galleries and built-in e-commerce features that make it a breeze to sell your work directly to customers. They also have intuitive tools like their easy importer, 
which pulls content from sites like Instagram, Twitter, and Flickr, so you don't have to spend precious time uploading old artwork to your site. And they provide you with quality service. With 24-7 email support, they'll help you out in a pinch if you ever find yourself in a scary situation. Check out Squarespace for a free trial, and if you like what they have to offer, you can save an additional 10% off your purchase by going to squarespace.com slash proco. The link is also in the description. That's squarespace.com slash proco. The jawbone got vetoed. <laughs> I, I thought that was a cool idea, but I asked a couple of the folks here at the studio and they were not on board. So we made the judgment call and the ax is back in action. So I'm gonna use adjustment layers, and I'm gonna use, in this case, hue saturation. These are adjustment layer masks. It's not destructive, so it's not gonna permanently affect the layer directly. This is a mask to the layer. So first I'm gonna start down with my background, my bottom layer, background. Going for something like, it's not exactly realistic, but something like Apocalypse Now. I'm gonna use a clipping mask to control where that adjustment layer is affecting. It is only affecting the layer directly beneath it. I'm gonna do the same thing with the sun. Another adjustment layer, I'm gonna use hue saturation. I'm gonna go to colorize, uh, darken it just a bit because we need to bring in some hue. Make it a lot more saturated. Boom, liking that. And we've got to set this to clipping mask as well. I'm just gonna to start to apply some color and then there's gonna be like a balancing which is gonna to have to occur. And I wanna create like a basic like a warm, cool, or complementary separation within the image. So I'm going for this like kind of swampy green blue. But in this case, I'm gonna use selective color because I've got more than one, one uh, color or more than one value on here. I'm gonna select blacks. In my blacks, I'm going to introduce a purple, rich, like a rich purple, yeah. And my midtones, I'm gonna introduce swamp thing green. Get back to my black and pull out cyan yeah i just want something that's gonna help to separate them from the background and i'm gonna duplicate this same adjustment layer and bring it over to my axe create a clip mask there so the axe is being affected in the same way and then i think i'm going to send this back try to send this back in space okay it's Kind of starting to get to what I want to, what I was intending. Hmm, that's cooler. Ooh, that's kind of cool. Kind of digging that. But still, these clouds are like, um, hmm, that's better. I gotta get this pumpkin to have a face, okay. And what I want to do is like sample a color from somewhere else in the image. I want to create some, start to create like a color family within the piece. I think this kid needs something else. He needs like a little baseball cap. I like that. I'm liking this way more now. It's interesting how what seem like simple choices or small adjustments can go a long way towards making something feel right. I think I need to hit an eye inside of Swamp Thing. Eye shape is really important. There we go. Need the top of the pumpkin, a little husk. Little hair, little pumpkin jerry curl. And I could spend a lot of time on something like this trying to just get it to get it just so. It's both a weakness and a strength of mine. When kept under control, it's a strength. I'm trying to bring in some critters into the scene. They bring a little bit of life. Again, I want to sample colors from the little color family we've been establishing here. Mickeybees is an element to help like reinforce some depth. Ooh, that was cool. A little bit of negative space. I like that. I wonder what this kid's name is. Probably something silly like Stan. Actually, his name's probably Marshall. <laughs> this kid, this kid's name is Marshall. And there's some other adjustments I like to do at the end as I'm getting closer to finishing. A couple different adjustment layers that help can help bring things together. Yeah, I like that. So this color lookup tool, it kind of acts as like an overlay and it can help to unify all the elements in the image. It's like a shortcut to color balancing. Okay, let's try 
some little fireflies now. It's another element that can help to create some atmosphere, a little bit of movement in the piece. That was a couple ways you can apply the glow. One is you can actually just put on an outer glow layer style, set it to screen. It doesn't look so bad. A little bit of light bloom can go a long way. It's too yellow, too intense. I kind of pull back on it. Do the same thing on this little mouth. What's cool about screen layer, or one of the interesting things about it, is you adjust the intensity of the glow with the lightness slider. The darker it is, the less intense the glow will be. I don't really want it that intense. At this point, I'm going to create a stamp of my image. It's Control Shift Alt E. And I'm going to use this at the top to start running some of my little finishing touches on. One of those is going to be adding noise. Swatches. I'm going to select a about like a 50% gray or something in there. Whoops. First I have to fill the layer. Get some noise in there. Okay, I've got some noise. We're going to set it to soft light. As you can see, it's adding a little bit of a grain back there. So I'm going to drop down the opacity. That's feeling pretty good right there. 38. It brings in just a little bit of tooth to the image. Oh, I just forgot something. I got to sign this baby. Give it the good old F. Makes me laugh. It's like getting an F in school. <laughs> like one of my last things I do is bring in some dust and scratches. Again, I could probably crank on this thing for hours more. It's just part of my personality that I like to, um, yeah, I just will I'll tend to obsess. Or more often what I'll do is I'll take, take a rest on this and give it a break for a couple days and just kind of think about it and look at it. And I'll put it up on my desktop back home and just have it as the background. So then if I'm just like reading and my computer's on in the background, I can allow myself to sort of like absorb the image. And I'll usually find the answers of how to wrap it up or how to push it that last like 10 to 20 percent to, you know, what I feel is a finish. That's something I haven't done in a while. Go to lighting effects. And sometimes I'll run like an omni light or some sort of like strong directional light onto the page. Again, that sort of starts to create that feeling that this is like something that's been photographed in a flash. Run that omni light on it. And then set it to, I haven't done this in a while actually. Darken, I think it is. Yeah, it just kind of creates like a gradient, like out, like this subtle gradient out towards the edge of the page that I think is fun. The problem is that sometimes when you do this kind of stuff, you get what's called banding in the areas where your gradients start to overlap with other values. Okay, so I'm going to try this. Stamp, stamp visible. Control shift alt E. And then we're going to run some chromatic aberration on this bitch. And I only put it on like partial blast, 50% blast. Just want that feeling of a photograph. Yeah, that's about right. All right, thanks guys so much. Appreciate your patience. I think we're going to call it. I know I could probably spend many more hours on this image, but I'm feeling good about it, my color relationships and my composition. Thanks to Stan and the rest of the crew here at Proco Studios. I look forward to being with you guys for the next two videos. Thanks a lot. Take care. <laughs>